All right, much better. All right, so uh, project one has been released. If you go to the materials folder, there's not only the lecture for today, but also now there should be project one. Uh, I think I just copied it over. It is even money if I had a typo. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, I changed the dates. And if you notice, the syllabus is updated as well. Uh, so now uh, the first checkpoint is due on the 21st, which I knew when I said it, what the date was. That's uh, next Tuesday. And then the final project is due uh, the following Wednesday. So two Wednesdays from now. Um, so basically the first chunk, uh, there's, I want to say it's like eight or 10 questions um, is due kind of early. And then you kind of do the rest of it. Um, don't delete your prior answers. Okay. So the whole, the, you know, up through project one checkpoint is also is actually graded in project one. Okay. So the first part is really just kind of like a check. Did you get, you know, did you get there? Um, and then the second one is the actual grade. Okay. So you can kind of ignore whatever grade you get in the checkpoint. Um, except as feedback for where you might have a mistake that you want to fix before you submit it for real. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. The midterm is, as I think I've mentioned before, I moved it to the discussion section. So um, that should be a lot easier than trying to do it in here. So it'll be basically in CDS in whatever your normal discussion section is. Um, you know, one thing I've already had one comment, uh, please don't schedule travel for when you have class uh, because just because you wanna go somewhere for spring break does not mean that you uh, then get to have an alternate makeup exam or whatever. Uh, so, you know, your first job is going to school, right? So please make that a priority. Um, we'll discuss whether there'll be an alternate exam or not or some other mechanism to make it up. One thing I will say though, is that uh, because the discussion section is much shorter than the lecture, uh, the upshot to moving it to the other room besides it being significantly more comfortable is that the exam should be short. So we're gonna restructure it a little bit. So we'll do uh, the exam review basically in the lecture the day before. So whenever that is, the I guess the second, um, and we'll do that on the second and just you know whatever was in there before, I think it, it was actual um, like content, but we'll do the midterm review on the second uh, and on the third will be the exam. So theoretically, I updated all this in the syllabus correctly and posted it to Piazza. Um, again, even money if there's typos. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I'll basically, when I'm done writing the midterm, I will, bring it up in the lecture during one of these sections and talk about what's in the midterm and how it's going to work. Okay. Uh, I presume no one's going to start studying for it now. So we can, we can worry about it in a week or so. Um, but yeah, so it, it revises my plan quite a bit to do it in 50 minutes versus doing it in whatever, an hour and 15. So, all right. Any other questions? Uh, so I said I'd post these last time, but I showed them off last time. They are in this slide. Um, so it just didn't land in the other slide. Uh, so they will be there as soon as you get there. But I think we talked about it last time. Uh, what's in there? So moving on to the actual lecture. Uh, first, we're going to start with a little bit. Sorry, I'm trying to use two computers at once today to see if we have less technical issues. Um, but so think about with histograms, the axes of the histogram, right? So that X and the Y, um, which I invariably invert. So if I say it incorrectly, please bear with me. But, you know, the X kind of goes up and down, right? And the Y goes side to side. Um, they're kind of not what you typically think of in a chart, right? You have to kind of extrapolate a little bit from them. They are labeled, but I think they can be kind of confusing. So this is kind of an important slide. Um, because it kind of tells you that there's a lot, there's a lot in a histogram that kind of decides the numbers on the bottom and the side, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. And we're going to talk about a few of those in a second. Um, but yeah, you can all read. 
I hope. I make this. Nope. Nope. Uh, that doesn't really work either. I'm trying to find a better way to uh, show this for myself so I can see it. Um, I hate not knowing what my next slide is. All right, so uh, we talked about this a little bit, I think last time or the time before, um, but the height measure density. So you can imagine here, right? It's really easy to count these, but if you didn't have the little bars, it still means the height actually tells you how much stuff is in there, right? Because you can imagine that even though you can't see the little lines in between the things, they are there, right? You just, they're too small to see, imagine, or whatever. But so you can actually calculate the, how much stuff is in each bucket uh, based on the height. Um, and it's true kind of irrelevant of the size of the, uh, of the bins, okay? Um, and so if you notice, the, you know, we've got the same number, that eight in the middle. I think it's the same as the prior slide. Um, yeah, so that kind of middle one, you know, it's wider, but it's only got eight, so it's still, it still tells you how many things are in it. It's just that it's a little bit stretched out, so it's shorter, but it's still wider, right? So you can calculate it with this handy little formula. Um, and, you know, so we draw it out like this just to make it a little clearer. Uh, you know, when we're doing this in like Python or whatever, we always use just a slash for the division. But the kind of the idea here, right, is so the percent in the bin is divided by the width of the bin, and that'll give you the height. Okay. So does everyone know what I mean by density? How common a word is that? We use it in tech all the time. It's like how much you can shove into the particular space, right? So, the, for example, the density of the chairs you're sitting in is at least as much as the density of your body in terms of atoms, right? Because otherwise, we wouldn't hold you up. All right, now we have a question. So what does height not measure? All right, get those answers in. All right, three, two, one. All right, so how many times to copy a table? Uh, seems like the preferred choice. And that is the correct answer. All right, so what about, this is the, I guess that would work. So this is that formula we just saw. Um, so if you notice the graphic is in the top right. So which one is A, which one is B, which one is C?
All right, get the answers in. All right, three, two, one. All right, I find this view quite confusing. So, but the correct answers are A is height, and then B is the percent of the bin, and then C is the width of the bin. And it looks like most people got it right. So, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself in my, uh, my own slides. Um, so, Basically, these are the two big things that you can use the histogram if you're actually kind of measuring it with a ruler, right? So how many of your individuals are in the bin? You use the area, right? So you figure out the, the area of the box for that particular thing for the histogram and how crowded is the bin, okay? And keep in mind, right? Remember how I pointed out that with a bar graph, the, the bars don't touch, but with a histogram, they do touch, right? So that means that when you're drawing that line around it to try to figure out, say, an area, you don't, you're not bound to the bins, right? Does that make sense? So you can actually draw your box rectangle, whatever, further out than one bin. So you can actually take multiple bins. You also don't have to go all the way up because you can take any piece of it, right? And it will be correct if you just take a box anywhere inside the history. Follow me? Like that makes sense? So how does it get followed? It's how many, well, how many individuals are in that in that spot? So that's what I was kind of saying is that you're not necessarily bound to the bin. You can just draw that box in kind of an arbitrary way, but most people will think about it as a bin, right? And so that'll tell you about that bin, but you can you could make that box weirdly arbitrary. And if I recall correctly, in last semester's midterm, there was a question about this. It uses that ability. Um, all right, and so how crowded is the bin is use height, right? So it kind of will just tell you uh, like how busy that, that area is, right? I hate to reuse a word, but. All right, is that gonna, oh. And now for something completely different. Who knows a Khan Academy? <laughs> all right. Does anybody know how Khan Academy started? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it was like just kind of a lark, right? Um, and he had this really unique um, like approach where he's not in the video, but he's it's still really captivating and relatively easy to watch. Uh, one of the things they say about recorded lectures, right, and why I try to use something like Zoom with video or whatever, is that they're very hard to follow, usually without a human in them uh, for most people to watch. But there's something about how, I think his first name is Ira Khan, um, did his videos that are still pretty easy to watch. So one of the things I periodically try to do is like, okay, now here's somebody completely different explaining a thing, and maybe it'll help you understand it better. So. Assuming the technology gods are with us. Hey. Is that loud enough? In the back, can you guys hear it? Some okay. ties might have over 100 cherries, while other ties might have fewer than 50 cherries. So what you're curious about is what is the distribution? How many of the different types of ties do you have? How many ties do you have that have a lot of cherries? How many ties do you have that have very few cherries? How many buys are in between? And so to do that, you set up a histogram. What you do is you take each buy and then have a cross, cross buy, and then I pick the cherry buy, and I pick the buy. So you take each of the buys in your in your store, and you count the number. You count the number of cherries on it. So each buy letter is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But you keep counting. And let's say it has 32 cherries. You do that for every buy. And then you create buckets because you don't want to create just a, a graph. I'm going to have exactly cherry. You just want to get a general sense of it. So you create buckets of 30. You say, how many buys have between 0 and 49 cherries? How many buys have between 30 and 59, including 30 and 50? 
How many pies have at least 60 and at most 89 chips? How many pies have at least 90 and at most 119? And then how many chuck pies have at least 120 and at most 149? And you know that you don't have any pies that have more than 129 cherries. So this should account for everything. And then you count those. So for example, say, okay, five pies have 30 to 59 cherries. And so we create a histogram. Or you create a histogram and you make this magenta bar go up to five. But that's how you would construct this histogram. That's what the size of different charity levels histogram is telling us. So now that we know how to construct it, let's see if we can interpret it based on the information given in the histogram. So the first question is, based on just this information, can you figure out the total number of pies in your store? Assuming that they're all accounted for by this histogram. I encourage you to pause the video and try to figure it out on your own. What's the total number of pies? Well, let's see, there's five pies. There's five pies that have two more, that have more than sorry, 30 or more, and so have at least 30 cherries, but no more than 50 pies. You have eight pies in this blue bucket. You have four pies in this green bucket. And then you have, what is this, five? And then 30 pies that have at least 120, but no more than 40 cherries. So I'm going to pause it there because it hits the limit of my patience. Um, but it's embedded in the slide, so you can always watch the rest of it later if you like his approach. Um, I was going to see if I'm trying to remember what. So, yeah, so this is kind of the basic interpretation of a histogram. Um, but then we also have this one, which, let's see how this is going to play. I'm going to YouTube it again. Which is going to have an ad because I'm not logged in to a paid account. Apologies. But now you know all about Hondas. Oh, no, I can't do it. All right, let's see if we can do this one. Uh, this one's a little more esoteric, but I thought it was good because. He's also very quiet. So some of the stuff we already talked about, but here's kind of an example of what I was talking about where you can kind of cross lines, right? To figure out what's happening inside of a histogram. Um, and here's another good example. So he's actually using this tool that lets you draw histograms and then like how they, um, which I think is still on the interwebs. Okay, cool. What is the Okay, you check it from. Now, if you ask what you mean, you check it from. I play it and we'll get the frequencies that you are. What you're going to carry. Okay, so what you do is you take the number of pies that are in the all right, but again, hits the limit on my patients. But I do recommend them. Uh, I think I've got a few more that we might talk about next week um, that are, I think, about more charts in general. All right, so bar chart versus histogram. I may have already shown this slide, um, but I can't remember. But I think it's worth repeating is that, you know, making sure you're recognizing the difference. <laughs> what do they measure? Um, and why they're useful. Um, so both of them are, you know, good ways to uh, visualize, a, you know, a set of information um, that's kind of categorical.
Oh, that's cool. Um, all right. So in short, here's the kind of four different types of charts we're going to talk about or we use in this class. There are others, obviously. Um, but these are kind of like bread and butter for data science, right? You use them all the time. Um, and they're really important to make sure you're using the right one at the right time. And it's really important that you realize their capabilities um, and what you can visualize with it. Because really, you know, that that whole you know picture is worth a thousand words really does make a big difference when you're trying to communicate to other humans about some set of data. Um, so quickly, scatter plot is the relationship between two numerical values. A line graph is sequential data, usually over time, um, but not necessarily, but usually. Um, and line graphs are particularly useful, especially if you want to compare things over time, right? Um, scatter plots can also be good for comparing like a set of four different things, let's say, um, and kind of there towards the very end of the semester, we'll talk about how we can use that in, in certain kinds of prediction algorithms. Um, then a bar chart is distribution of categorical data. So this is like how many movies, you know, how many um, movies were produced by which studio that made, you know, a million plus dollars or whatever. Um, and then a histogram is the distribution of numerical data. So, you know, the density or like how, how much does it tend to be? And we use histograms a lot. <clears throat> All right. And now there's a question. Look at that. Shocking. All right. So what's the best plot for showing a distribution of categorical data? All right, we close it down. All right, looking pretty good. So, so the key is a distribution of categorical data, right? Whereas Instagram is more a distribution of numerical data. All right. Oh, another question. They're always kind of a surprise to me. So what's the best plot for showing sequential data? This has a little bit of a accidental trick questionness to it, but. All right, get your answers in. Three, two, one. All right, so a line graph. And does anybody know why it's kind of an accidental uh, trick question? Yeah, so he uses the word plot in the question. Um, plot arguably is kind of a generic term for graphs in general. Um, and so when typing this, fingers said plot, you know, um, so it's kind of an unintentional tie to scatter plot. Um, but the correct answer is a line graph. Um, and basically the keyword here, right, is sequential. All right, to match the plot with the data they primarily work with. So this is like all of them. As you can tell, I've had semesters in the past where students had a really hard time with graphs. So I kind of beat it like a dead horse.
All right, get the answers in. Three, two, one. All right, so scatter plots, relationships, line, sequential, bar, categorical, and histogram, numerical as categories. All right, so this one is another set of questions, but kind of done slightly differently. I would like to point out the fancy, fancy yellow that is very difficult to read, but I couldn't find another color in time. Um, so if we had this information, right? So this is prediction, or uh, sorry, past weather conditions. Uh, and so, um, you know, let's just say for the sake of argument that the day is the, uh, like a sequential day number, not necessarily the day of the month. Um, the high is in Fahrenheit, if you couldn't guess, because that in Celsius would be very warm. Um, and the low is uh, also in Fahrenheit. Uh, the high is the highest temperature of the day, and the low is the lowest temperature of the day, except it's 24 hours. So, for example, I think just like this week or something, um, maybe it was last week, uh, the low for Boston, or sorry, the high for Boston actually took place at like 4 a.m., um, which is kind of unusual. Usually it's colder at night, right? Um, so usually the low is overnight and then the high is during the day, but not all. And then we have kind of the weather conditions. So what type of chart would I use to figure out, are there more cloudy than sunny days? Oops. And I will, I will ask for answers in a second. Sorry, trying to get this thing so I can read it. Um, all right, so uh, what type of graph would I use to look at, are there more cloudy versus uh, sunny days? Bar chart. Bar chart, why? Right, the categorical data. So you're just gonna be looking at the category and trying to figure out how many there are. All right, then we have the next one, which is what percentage of days have a high above 75 degrees? So how do I, like what would be the best graph maybe to try to figure that out? Yeah. Oh, what? Okay, and how? Uh, Okay, uh, so you have two categories, right? They're over 75 and, and uh, under 75, right? Or one of those is inclusive. Um, so you just have two bins, right? And you have a histogram, and now you've got a percentage on one side and a percentage on the other. So exactly right. Uh, let's see, what's, there's one more. Uh, do hotter days tend to also have hotter nights? So what, so the, we're not looking for the answer to the question, but what graph would I use to figure out the answer? I think there's a movie about this. A little louder, sorry. A scatter plot. I think that seems reasonable. Why would you use a scatter plot? Right. So you're comparing two numerical data sets, in a sense. Um, and so you can kind of put them on a scatter plot and it will show you their relationship, right? Okay. Uh, so. Jupiter, somewhere. Run this. Uh, so how's this for size? Because this is not my computer. Uh, let me just fix it. Uh, is that good for size? You want a bigger? I think I normally do it bigger. It's good? Okay. Um, so let me run this. And apparently I missed one. or it's just broken. Well, I thought I had a typo in here and then I checked it and I was pretty sure I got it right. 
Oh, thank you. I knew there was something wrong with it, um, but I couldn't remember what. All right, better. Okay, so I don't know what the class one says, but um, the uh, same problem, likely. All right. So this does not include your data, um, but it's from a survey that we did. Uh, and so we asked, uh, you know, do you prefer your right or left hand? We asked, uh, which pant leg do you put on first? Um, but there is enough applicable. Um, sleeping side, which, what side do you like to sleep on? And there's actually four choices there, right? Um, and then what flavor M&M &M is the best flavor? Uh, and then what level of programming knowledge did you have kind of coming into the class? What level of specifically Python knowledge did you have? How many people do you text in the average 24 hours? Um, and then how many hours of sleep do you typically get a night? So this data is particularly handy for doing various charts. Um, and it's going to load for me. All right, might have to. Oh, I can do it this way. Okay, so um, so one of the things I wanted to point out is I'm going to use the group method because I want to know about uh, handedness, right? So one of the things I can do is I can say handedness equals survey, and then I'm going to group it by handedness. Handedness. I'm assuming I got the casing correct. Um, actually, let me print that. Okay, and so you can see it's kind of a handy little function, right? So uh, it just finds all the unique types of handedness, so left and right, and then a count of uh, how many entries there were of each. Um, and so because it's categorical, right, we can now easily make a bar chart out of that. And again, I'm using bar H to make it sideways, um, and that can kind of show us the, the relationship between the two. There's obviously a lot more right-handed people, at least in the survey set, than there are uh, left-handed people. So one of the things we'll talk about later, does this tell us that there are more right-handed people in the world versus left-handed people in the world? What do you think? Uh, let's see, who else? Anybody else? Oh, it tells us how there's more right-handed people in our survey, but we don't necessarily know if there's if it's a big enough survey to know if that's enough uh, to say there's more right-handed people in the world. It's actually not too much bigger than that to say for the US, uh, which is actually kind of crazy, um, but we'll talk about that in a few lectures. Do you have a question? No. Well, only if I specify. Um, like, so if the question says, show me a horizontal bar graph, yes. But generally speaking, I don't say that. It's just bar without an H. Any other questions? All right. So we can start making some histograms. Why am I having a day? We were having such good technology today too. Thanks. Yeah, it's Python, Python, just Python. Oh, I have it correct in my cheat sheet. I just didn't make it into the, uh, the live one, of course. I must just not have copied it over. All right, so we can do a histogram. Um, and we can, it'll break it up into bins. And so this is a little bit weird, right? Because the, the bins kind of came out weirdly, right? So 
this his gram is a little unclear. So you might want to think about not taking the default bins on this particular one because it's it's spreading it out, right? And so it's not clear where what's really going on. But in fact, these are just like entities. Okay, they're still part of the same contiguous graphic. It's just that these ones are empty. So be aware of weirdness like that. Um, and then I think this one's just called sleep, right? Yeah. All right, but this one's a little easier um, to read, I think. Um, and it's kind of interesting, right? We see pretty, you know, we, we see like a lot of people are between seven and eight hours of sleep. Um, but I think it's weird that there's like this big gap and then it jumps up here. Um, and then you kind of see this other gap here and then it goes down to six. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think college students generally don't sleep a ton. I also don't sleep a ton, so. Um, but I slept less when I was in college. So. How would I find out the maximum number of hours that any person slept? using a function. So I can tell by looking at this histogram, but let's say I want the number. Right. So max survey, oops, column. Oh, and one of the things I want to point out here is so I can use max here on with the column method, okay? But what what's the other way I can get just that single column back? What's the other method I can use? Select, select. and would this work? <laughs> Probably not, right? Because select returns a table of one column, whereas column returns an array with just that data. So just kind of keep that in mind. They do have different uses, even though they seem like they're interchangeable. All right, so now we have the maximum sleep hours, and then we're just going to do the obvious and go after the min sleep hours. And now we might want to rethink those bins so that we can maybe even it out a little bit. So we could say um, sleep bins. And I don't want to actually do any work. So I can do this. But let's say we want to do this by bigger buckets, right? So now our sleep bins, actually, let me print that. So now our sleep bins are bigger, right? So now they're two hours wide by using that, oops by using that um, uh, that two step on the end. But now I can kind of include it a little more easily. I don't have to actually calculate it. Um, and then I can show off my, good gracious today. Maybe, yes. And so, so this way, when I'm doing this histogram, right, I'm doing the histogram based on sleep size, but I want to um, I want to have kind of bigger bins so that it's a little clearer what's going on. So that way I can say, hey, look, right side sleepers uh, tend to be, I don't know, sleep seven or eight hours, right? Um, and left side sleepers are kind of the same, but they have a much smaller group that uh, sleeps the fewer side. So. Apparently, you'll need less sleep if you sleep on your right side. I think it's the takeaway. Not really, but yeah. So, just kind of some things to do with histograms. Um, and I wanted to go through methods. Um, some of these you've already seen, but uh, we'll talk about them kind of formally. Yeah. The last one, 
because my bin was capped there. I probably should have done max plus one. Yeah. So they would go past 10. So it'd be inclusive. There was a question over here on the left. Did you have a question? Um, can you see the Oh, it's because it's sleep versus sleep hours. Here? Um, Probably. Yeah. Same stupid bug. Yeah. Okay, so deaf statements. Okay, usually referred to as deaf statements because otherwise it would be too many letters. Um, but it's short for defined, okay, or defined functions or defined methods. Um, but the keyword is actually defined. Uh, and the reason is, is because, and I think I mentioned this before, is this is just a variable name like max, whatever it was, max sleep hours, right? It's just the name of a thing. And in this case, we're using this keyword here to say that this name of a thing is actually a method. Okay, so it has some special qualities about it in that it can take parameters um, and then it has a return value. Um, I think this is a fancy, fancy build slide. Um, so this is the name of our method or function. Then these are what are called our arguments, right? Or parameters. And then this is the part that is referred to as the body of the method. Okay, and one thing to point out in Python, the distinguishing characteristic of where the body is, there's a colon after the end of the define, okay? And then it's indented by one, technically it's half, okay? So if you want a little bit more legend background, does anyone know of the tab versus space wars, right? How many people here know what a tab is, right? So you know the tab button on your keyboard? There are many, many programmers who believe very vehemently that you should use a tab, which is an actual white space character like a hard return, versus four spaces or eight spaces, depending on kind of the resolution you want to get to. Um, and it really is a matter of like, you are a bad person if you use the wrong one. Um, it's kind of hilarious, uh, but people take it very, very seriously. Um, however, most of the time, spaces wins. Okay. Anybody know why that might be? More specific. It's more specific. It renders the same way. Um, so a tab is what's called, it's actually short for tab stop. Okay. And it literally comes from printing press. Okay. And it's how much space you should put before, like after a headline for an article, for example. Um, so because of that, Basically, printing presses were variable. They worked based on the specific thing they were trying to print. So tab stops are kind of not always the same. And if you go into like, you know, your favorite word processor, for example, you can actually modify the length of the tab stop. My screen keeps locking because I forgot to hit caffeine. Um, so many people prefer spaces. Keep in mind, you, most editors will let you swap. Like it'll actually let you define which one you want. All right, so that's the body. But then this other part of it is called the return expression, okay? And so the thing, another interesting characteristic of a method, right, is it has the option to return information. So for example, with the max function, it takes in a set of numbers and it will give you back the biggest, okay? That is the return value which is given to you by the return expression. Why is this important? It's important because every method, if you wanted to actually give anything back, you have to have a return, okay? Because you can just have a method that just kind of does its thing and doesn't return anything. Okay, so it's kind of like when I do those assignment statements and forget to print it, right? It just does it and then moves on its merry way. So keep in mind that, that return is really important and as we get into what's called control flow character, control flow commands, um, it'll matter because you need to make sure you hit one of those returns if you want it to always return something. All right. And then I think we have a few method examples. 
or function examples. I think uh, function versus method is like one of those things. It's like whatever class you took first that taught you the term function versus method is whichever one you use forever. Um, so functions. Um, so we're going to create a function and it's just going to be, oops, let me get rid of that. We want something that'll just multiply by three. Okay, so we're going to add, uh, you know, so we have an argument in there, a, a parameter uh, called x, and then we're going to have three times x, and that's going to return the value. And so if I call triple with a three, I'll get nine. Now, if I do it with a variable, I can do the same thing and I'll just get a 12. Okay, so the fact that it's in a variable or not doesn't matter. Um, and then, you know, and it can get arbitrarily large. And as I, I think I've said before, I'm not sure, um, but in some ways you can kind of think about the parentheses in a method as almost being like part of whatever that mnemonic is that I can never remember, but, uh, you know, whether you do multiplication in parentheses and stuff, the parentheses will be done, the stuff in the parentheses will be done before the method is actually called. So you get that multiplication first. All right, so now a note about scope, okay? So the term scope references like where in kind of space we are when we're talking about programming. So in this case, we have this triple X up here, right? So I've defined that, okay? So much like I've defined this num here, but if I run this, I'm gonna get an error because X doesn't exist. Why doesn't X exist? Because it's not in this scope. It's only in the scope of inside that map. So the term is, for, is called scope, but really it's just, is the thing valid still? Okay, or is the thing valid in this place that you're trying to use it? So, X is invalid, um, but I can do, x equals five, okay? So now x is valid, right? So I get a five for that. But if I call triple, uh, what do I have two times x, okay? And then I try to print x. Now remember, x gets assigned here, right? But what will x be here? Any idea? You know? Maybe five? I think you may be right. Um, so when I used the X inside the method in the triple, okay, that was in a different scope. So it doesn't have any effect on the one I'm in and vice versa, okay? So it's important to just keep track of what scope you're in. Yeah. So, so most of, mostly, yes. Um, so basically, if you move into a different scope and you'll know when you're doing it, so you call a method or whatever, that's when you change the value of X. So for example, if I called, here's another, another way of showing it too. Let's say I did, um, I never remember how you add in here. Um, but let's say I did def uh, quadruple. Excuse me, I spell that right. And let's say it's y. And then let's say um, x equals y times four. And then, oh, I've got a colon. Nope. Nope. And then return y. Okay. And then if I call quadruple. Okay. So that'll give me 10 as expected. But what is x equal to still equal to 5, right? So 
even if I have set it up here, or let's say I made that, you know, N or something, N will be invalid out here because it's only valid in this scope. So when you're whenever you're within a method, it is just in that scope. And if you're outside of it, you're in that scope. And this is also true if you have a method that calls another method, right? You can imagine that quadruple could call triple. Probably give the wrong answer, but it could call triple, right? The scope of each one is still unique. That makes sense? Okay. And then we talked a little bit about types. Um, and so if you remember, we can actually use a method. We can use triple on something like high, right? Because the fact that it's multiplying it by three, we know that if we have a string and we multiply it by three, it'll give us that same string three times, right? So there's nothing, at least in Python, about the fact that triple is normally used with a number that forces it to be used with a number. And then, and then I can even do even more complex things like pass it in an array, for example. Let's do what I have. And so it will, because if we multiply an array by three, it goes through and multiplies each value, right? And creates a new array with those values. So now I passed in, you know, zero through three and multiplied each one by three using triple. All right. Then. I'm going to skip this one. Um, we'll talk about multiple arguments. So you're also not limited to just one argument. Okay. So you can have as many as you want. So we can make a method called hypotenuse, which I'll probably spell wrong about six times. And we can have it take two parameters. Okay. So let's call them X and Y, like we have in the graphic above. Um, so this is just how do we get the, the value of the hypotenuse? So we know it's going to be, um, sorry, get my uh, spacing right here. Um, oops. And then we're going to say return. Oops. Okay. So now I have my hypotenuse method. Um, it takes two parameters, x and y. And I can say hip squared, you know, it does the, the square of the x and the square of the y. And then it does the square root to get the hypotenuse. Um, so now I can just pass in multiple functions. The one thing that uh, I should have had in here, but didn't, um, is I can also do, let's see if it's gonna, yeah. Um, I can also do y equals 10, x equals four, okay? So I don't need to go necessarily in order if I give the name of the parameters, right? And you've actually seen us do this before. So like descending equals true. Descending is the equivalent of the y or the x. Okay, it's just the name of one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, parameters or arguments to the function. Um, and so as long as you give the name, you can specify them in any order you want. The thing is, the the second you use a name all the rest of them have to be named, okay? So if I did y equals 10, and I just put four here, I should get an error. I think, I think I'll get an error, let's try it. Um, okay. 
yeah, so I get an error because basically as soon as you start naming the variables, it doesn't want to make any assumptions, okay? So once you do one, you have to do the rest. Um, and let's talk about apply real quick. Um, let me just see. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so talking about apply because this, along with group is another very important function that a lot of people don't think of. Um, so it's important to try to remember that it exists. Um, so let's just create a table. And I'm gonna make it with two columns after I tab called person and this is going to be make array. Oh, wait, I already had it. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So you saw me typing a bunch of a table, but I didn't need it because it's in the next row. Um, so we'll ignore that one. Uh, and so I assume some of you will get the reference of what TV show these characters are from. Um, and so let's write a little method called def uh, cap at 1980 and x and then colon okay so Two things I want to point out here. So, okay, so this is um, basically we want to know if they're less than 1980. Otherwise, we're going to get 1980 uh, with this method. Um, customary for method names, if you want to separate words, okay, to make it clear what it is, you use an omission, okay, in Python. All right, and then you know we can we can test our new fancy little function by saying cap. Um, 1980, and we can do, you know, 1975 and get the expected outcome. We can also test it with, uh, let's do 1990. Okay, and so we still get 1980. So now, why do we care about this thing? Because we want to be able to use the apply function which you use on a table. And while this is a bit of a contrived example, okay, so a couple of things that I wanna show here. So remember I called it like, a method name, right, is really, it's just like a variable. It's just like a handle to whatever, right? Just like another variable would be to a number. So I can pass it around, okay? So you notice I'm not following it. So there's no parentheses there. I'm actually passing that method along to the apply function. So apply in one of its parameters can be a method, okay? And so I'm gonna pass it 1980. I'm gonna pass it a year, uh, sorry, a column name. And I'm going to do it hanging off of that ages scale. And what it's going to return to me is the result of that method, whatever it was, to each item in the table, okay, or each item in the column. So this is kind of like I did way earlier, right, where I did the dot column and I pulled the min off there, right? So I could do the same thing here. I could, call, I could put min right there, and actually I won't really get the right answer, um, because it operates on each one individual, okay? But so it, it does the whole set one at a time. So for each of those birth years, it pulls it if it's before 1980. Uh, otherwise, it just returns a 1980. Um, and this is super useful. Um, I had another demo, but I'm not, uh, maybe I'll show it real quick. Um, so I can do another one that's slightly more complicated and say def uh, name and age. Um, and let's say name. Oh yeah, this is a good one to show actually. 
Uh, 23, I guess, minus year, and then return. Okay, so I've got this fancy function now. And now what I can do is I'm gonna cheat and pull this so I don't have to type as much. And say name and age, and then person and birth year. Oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, that's a stupid error. Okay, so what's cool about this is apply can also be used with multi parameter functions. Okay, so what it will do is that's why the method is the first thing. Because the first thing is the name of your method. Then the next thing is the column that's going to go into parameter one, right? And the column that, and then the next one is the column that's going to go into parameter two, column that's going to go into parameter three, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so now I can make a function that operates on essentially like it could even be the whole table, right? If I needed pieces from all the way across that whole table. But in this case, what I did was I said, okay, just use the person in the birth year. And then I calculate how old they are based on their birth year. Um, and, you know, I say their name is, right? Um, and so the thing that I would say that was annoying is that I had to cast, okay, that's change the type of the age to a string to be able to include it in that string up there, um, which, in my opinion, is stupid. They should have figured it out. It's just a number, should have just cast it on its own. But whatever, Python. Um, does that make sense? Okay, I reiterate, apply is a very useful method along with group. Um, and for some reason, people invariably forget about it. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> All right, cool. Uh, let me throw the other slide back up. And I'll just skip these slides real quick. Oh, uh, here's, uh, here's some other examples of arrays, or, so, sorry, of methods. Um, and that was a thing we could talk about, but just a reminder the project one is out. Okay. You can do it as a group. Your groups are from the discussion section. Um, the tech one, one is due on the 21st. The actual thing is due on the first. Uh, and the midterm is on the third. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.